So we'd like to thank Kevin Patnatsu and Jim Davis for <laughs> coming in to uh, talk about social work. Um, so I'm going to ask you guys to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your educational history and what you're currently doing as a social worker. All right, well, contrary to the introduction, I'm Kevin Patansu, <laughs> and, uh, and I am a, currently my job is, is that I supervise social workers and case managers at UF Health Shands in the pediatric outpatient and psychiatry departments. Um, prior to that, I, I worked in the pediatric intensive care unit as a social worker for 10 years and I've also worked for the Department of Children and Family Services in some different capacities. I'm Jim Davis. I uh, currently work for the Veterans Administration in what's known as the hud Vash program, which is essentially working to find housing for homeless veterans. And prior to that, I've worked for Haven Hospice with uh, working with terminally ill patients for a long time, and I also worked with the Department of Children and Families positions there, and also I worked at Chance Hospital in the Burn Intensive Care Unit. All right, so thanks again for agreeing to do this interview. Um, so a lot of our undergrads are choosing between different careers in healthcare. So I wanted to ask you guys, what made you choose social work? I, I, kind of, I feel like social work kind of chose me. I was working for the Department of Children and Family Services, um, doing uh, food stamps and AFDC and Medicaid. I had a, a bachelor's degree from the University of Florida in communication processes and disorders, which really led me to work for nobody but McDonald's or the state. Um, and I was doing an emergency out in some rural area, and somebody started telling me about a master's in social work program that they were doing that I really didn't even know existed. And as soon as I got into the program, I realized it's what I had been looking for. And that's kind of similar to, to my experience. I had majored in history in college and minored in education. I was planning on being a teacher, but after getting involved in that, I decided I did not want to be a teacher, and I ended up getting a job in law enforcement. And I moved to Florida because my wife got a good job here, and I ended up just taking a job with the state. And while I was working there, a guy that I worked with told me about the master's program, and I was looking for something. I didn't want to keep doing what I was doing, and so I went to the, to the meeting about it got into it and it was, you know, I couldn't have found a better job for me and for what I, you know, like about my work. So after you get kind of your training in social work, what are the different career paths that one can go into? I mean, there's probably a lot you can do as a social worker. Well, one, I mean, one of the basic tenets of social work is to treat the person in their environment. And so there are a ton of different jobs that you can do as a social worker. Um, you know, you can work in the medical field in a hospital, but that's really a small portion of what social workers do. Um, you can work for state agencies or government agencies. Um, many school systems have social workers as their counselors. Um, social workers work with uh, the, the death and dying and the hospice situation, the VA. Um, I'm trying to think what other... Yeah. Just, many social workers actually do a lot of case management. So they're working, they, they, act, they try to find community resources for individuals from whatever perspective it is that they need assistance. Yeah. And social workers are, are trained to be able to provide mental health counseling therapy. We, we get licensed, et cetera. But there, it's more of a kind of a holistic approach than that when dealing with people. You're dealing with the, you know, their entire life situation a lot of the time. You're not just dealing with whatever they're presenting problems when they came to see you because there's a lot of other issues that are impacted by that problem or are impacting that problem and you sort of get involved in the nuts and bolts of trying to figure out a way to make those situations better beyond just the, the cognitive functioning or, or emotional issues or whatever to the, the actual, you know, practical day-to-day -day life obstacles that they have. And there, there are many, and that being said, there are many social workers in private practice that do psychotherapy that might have specific areas of interest and training that they specialize in just like many of the other mental health fields. Okay, so thinking back to when you guys were undergrads, what sort of experiences do you think undergrads currently should be trying to get if they want to go into grad school to get some more training in social work? Well, I would have bet money that I was never going to go to grad school <laughs> while I was in college, so I really can't answer that question very well. So I mean, I, I think that if you have a desire to help people, if maybe when you were in high school you volunteered for different organizations, maybe help people who were homeless, uh, domestic violence shelters, that sort of thing. 
exposing yourself to people, to real people out in the world and their real situations, um, it can really go a long way in helping you know, guide you if you decide to get a, a master's degree in social work. Um, you know, Jim and I both were protective investigators for the Department of Children and Family Services and going into people's living rooms and sitting down and looking at their environment and talking to them in their home and seeing how people lived and, and operated every day just really was a great learning experience and a great background for becoming a social worker. I also want to say is everybody thinks everyone that works for the state's a social worker. Social work is a protected title and it's only people who have a bachelor's degree or a master's degree in social work that really should be called social workers. Um, the Department of Children and Family Services normally takes anyone with a bachelor's degree of any kind. So I, I always like to make that a little clear for that particular job, but that's largely because it's a hard job to get people to take. So <laughs> right. they can't be very picky about the degrees. Have you ever seen undergrads volunteering where you work or is that an option if they were to reach out to a social worker and say, hey, I want to get some more experience in this? Um, I, at the hospital, I can speak for, for UFL Shams. We do allow people to shadow a social worker for a day. If you're interested, there's some basic confidentiality things that need to be done. Um, we actually um, have different uh, volunteer areas in the hospital, either through volunteer services or through other organizations. Um, I know that um, the uh, Streetlight program is a big organization. Some of you may already know about the Streetlight. Um, and they work with kids that are sick in the hospital and you would then be exposed to some of the things that you might see a social worker do in the hospital setting. My current job, we don't have any volunteers that come in and do work there, but in, when I was working for Haven Hospice, we had a lot of volunteers that came in and they did all kinds of different things for us, you know, filing, you know, they just, it, it depended if someone like dealt directly with the patients going and seeing them in their houses and things like that, so I didn't want to have with that, they just wanted to help out and they would they'd find something else for them to do. Sure. But, uh, we had a lot of volunteers there, but not that many that were students. Mm -hmm. but, and we had a lot of high school students would volunteer because they, uh, high school students do a lot. So. Okay. So I know you guys do a lot of different things, but when we talk to the different medical providers, we really like to ask them, what, are you, what do they do on a day to day basis? You know, put us in your shoes for a typical day for you. It could be now or a past job that you did whatever you think would be most helpful, but... Good. I've only been doing my current job for a, a few months, and so it's it, it is a kind of a specialized job. What I do is I get referrals and I make contact with homeless veterans, and then I try to get them to get all the documentation, things that they need in order to apply for, to get assistance for housing, and then I help them try to find a place to live, and then they, I, the, the job is kind of divided up in stratification a lot of what I do is kind of nuts and bolts type stuff and then I transfer them to another social worker who helps them deal with sort of the long term issues that they're facing and sort of resulting in them being homeless in the first place. Mm -hmm. the, the, the way we do it is housing first and then follow up with all those other kinds of psychosocial issues that are that are a problem like substance abuse or mental illness or no support system or whatever other issues then they try to work on those. But in my day to day job I'm just contacting them about making it so that they can get that process going to get into a place to live. So I know it's true. Okay. So. Uh, my current job is, is management. So I do manage social workers and nurse case managers. Um, I do also provide uh, supervision for uh, social MSWs that are working at the hospital to obtain licensure. Um, but thinking back in the pediatric intensive care unit, I was really part of a treatment team that included the physician, the nurse, dietitian, child life, um, physical therapist, and we would round daily on the 24 patients and it could be anything from uh, helping a family move towards withdrawal support for a patient to, um, you know, to quelling a, you know, an angry family to uh, helping somebody find the resources and how to meet their basic needs while they're in the hospital system. And I even would do some one-on-one -on -one counseling with couples. Um, and sometimes with teens that were awaiting organ transplants. So there was kind of, there was a wide variety of, of, of things. I will say one thing about the hospital setting is every area is different. If you're a transplant social worker, it's like you have a whole different practice than if you're an oncology social worker that, than if you're uh, just a plain, me a regular medical social worker.
so it, um, you, there's a lot of variety there as far as what the jobs look like in social work. And in my previous job at Haven Hospice, I drove around in my car and I went and visited people who were terminally ill and talked to them and their families about the various issues that come up because of that, their grief issues and, and practical issues of you know, a sudden change in income or needing a lot of care, someone to be able to provide care for someone who's terminally ill and that sort of thing. A lot of it was, you know, about their emotional things that were going on when they get back in touch with people they become estranged from and you know, helping them work through those kinds of things. So it was a it was much more of a, you know, a clinical kind of a job where I was like sitting and helping them deal with issues in my current position. It was very, it was very interesting and rewarding work. I really enjoyed it a lot. And it was, I said, completely different when I'm doing that. So this might be a hard question, but what would you say is the most rewarding part of being a social worker? And what's the biggest challenge or what's the most difficult part? I mean, I would say, in, in my experience, the most rewarding experience have been working with patients who are in their families when someone is dying and the family allows you to become you know part of that process opens themselves up and allows you to to be there with them and guide them and help them through that process so it's a it's a very humbling and it's, it's an honor that they they do that and they allow you to be part of that um, I think the hardest part right now is really resources the economy's bad um, you know and, and when people come to the hospital, I call it the medical vacation. They have all the expense of being on vacation and none of the fun. They have to pay for a place to stay. They have to pay for their food to eat out. They have to pay for parking. Um, and, and the expenses just come on and on. And families plan for months and months in advance to take a vacation and save up their money. But when a child becomes ill or an adult becomes ill and they're all of a sudden thrown into the system, it, it's, a, it's really difficult and there's limited resources to help them. And I worked in hospice care for 10 years, and the way people would ask me about my, about my job and the way I would describe it to them is, I drive around out in the country, and I go to people's houses when they really, really need help, and then I help them. So, that is, <laughs> it's not a bad way to spend your days, it really isn't, because there people, you know, I had been there for a while, and I knew kind of how, what they were going through. I knew what a lot of the questions were going to come up. I knew what their reactions were going to be to a lot of things because I'd seen it before and I would be able to, you know, say, all right, now here's what you need to do. Here's here's what may be happening, et cetera. And, and you know, they're floundering. They, you know, they've got this diagnosis and they don't know what to do and they don't, you know, they don't know who to ask. And I get to come in and sit down and say, well, now, this is doable. We'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do this. Get them resources, do that kind of thing. So it was, that was extremely rewarding. And, and when I worked in that job and also particularly when I worked as a child abuse investigator, there were a lot of times on my way home from work, I got to say to myself, it's a good thing I went to work today. It's a good thing I showed up. And that, you know, like I said, it's a, that is a fine way to spend your career. Is there one success story that really stands out in your mind? I mean, I know you see a lot of people. <sighs> I see a lot of people. Um, I actually have one more. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, when I was in the pediatric intensive care, you know, we had a young man who was uh, going into his senior year in high school. He was, had, was just turning 18, was driving to go see his girlfriend, and a cow came out in front of his car, and he hit the cow, and he became a then dependent quadriplegic. Um, and it was a really long process for him. Um, we we're, were clear for a long time he was going to live. And he had a lot of different issues, both at his, in his home environment as well, that kept it so that he was not able to leave the hospital for a long time. But two of the things that we did, I'm really proud of, is one, we um, were able to, with the with this this team of physicians and nurses, we were able to uh, bring him so he could go to his senior prom. And one of the nurses was his date, and he was in a tuxedo, and so he got to go to prom. And then uh, we actually were able to transport him, and he lived out in a rural area, to be able to go to his graduation. And we had him on a portable ventilator, and we were able to get him up on stage to get his diploma because he was able to take classes while he was he was in the hospital. And then finally, we were able to successfully help his parents obtain a home that was suitable for him to go into, and he was able to go home. But there's a whole bunch of things I can mention. I'll, I'll just real briefly talk about too. I liked when I was working for the Department of Children and Families, there were several cases where I got to sort of like go against the standard practice because there was something else that would work better for this particular situation. And I was able to like 
make those things happen and have a good positive result where if the things just went the way it would normally go, in this particular case it wasn't going to work. And I, I really enjoyed the efforts I, when I was successful in doing that in a couple of cases. And I had a, a lady when I was working for hospice who was, um, she'd had kind of a hard life and she was estranged from all of her kids and didn't, you know, and sort of lived alone in this little tiny apartment. And she was a really neat lady. I would go and see her. I love that lady. I would go and see her and I would say, well, how are you doing? I always had to ask how you're feeling, how's your pain, how's your breathing. She had a COPD, really, really severe COPD. She could barely walk for me to Kevin without, you know, having to sit down and rest. And, uh, but I would say, how, you know, how's your breathing today? And she'd tell me, oh, it's so really bad, I can do this. And I'd say, but I am not complaining. The Lord's been good to me. I'm doing great. And I ended up getting her to reach out to all of her family and her kids all got back involved in their lives. She'd been doing a little battle on her own, but I kind of encouraged her to do more of it. And it ended up where by the end of her life, she had a much richer support network and much richer experiences than she had before. And I was uh, very, very glad to be a part of that. So I know some of the jobs social workers can do, it's odd hours or it's you're doing a lot of different things driving around like for DCF. So how do you guys avoid burnout or avoid kind of taking your work home with you? I mean, I, I actually personally think that you could ask that of anybody. You could sure. ask that of a physician, of a nurse. So, um, you know, I think having good boundaries is really important. Um, having and maintaining good boundaries. Um, and doing a little bit of self-check every once in a while. Am I reacting differently than I normally um, had reacted in the past? Have I picked up some other habits that might be, be, be due to stress? Um, so I identify those, have somebody that you can talk with about the issues. I actually have a very, also have a very rich home life, and so um, I don't define myself by the work that I do as a social worker. It's, it's work that I do. Um, and part of our training as social workers also helped us be able to have good boundaries and, and deal with stress and identify stress. I kind of have a little visual that I do when I walk out of Shands, now I know some of you guys that are taking this class are students, so you might have been at the hospital. But there's these glass doors you go through, and I think about it like, like those um, in the places up north where they have the have like the big canvas places when, to keep the snow out. And I'm kind of like walking through it, and I'm stripping all of that away from me and walking to my car to go home and, and be. Well, I I can't really add too much to what he said. I think you know he's right on the mark about that. I was you know on the way home, it's a time that I would just sort of. Uh, so I'm just on the way home, just sort of decompress and start thinking about how the evening's going to go and, you know, the rest of my life besides my job and get out of that one mindset into the other, so. Okay. So a lot of the students taking this class is, or this class is, are going to become a physician. Um, so we like to ask, as a social worker, what are your daily interactions with physicians? You know, how, how do you usually work with them in the treatment of your patients? Um, and as it's a class with many future physicians, can you speak to the importance of collaborative care or how to make collaborative care effective? Well, I mean, I, I, I can go back to my experience in the intensive care unit. I, I felt like that was an extremely wonderful collaborative team. The medical director of the unit, I, I actually took part in interviewing fellow candidates, faculty candidates. Um, I would, um, you know, if there was a patient that they were thinking about bringing and they might have some kind of big psychosocial issue or placement issues, they would ask me to take a look at the case before accepting the patient from a medical standpoint. Um, and I was also there to help guide them through some of the trickiness of what the family was going through. Uh, even so much as, you know, sometimes physicians are busy and I would say, okay, so this is, there's Mr. and Mrs. so-and-so, and then there's the boyfriend, you just kind of get them settled before we went in to have important conferences. Um, and as the social worker on the unit, a lot of time I was the one that would pull together the different disciplines to be able to talk and come up with a collaborative approach to how to treat the patient. Um, so I, at least at UF, Shan, UF Health Shands, uh, you know, it, there is a very, um, there, there's a, a, a good appreciation for social work and, um, and everybody works really collaboratively, collaboratively as a team. Um, and what was the second part of that question? I'm sorry. Any tips about how to make it more effective working together from a social? I'm going to I'm going to tell you my 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 tip, and this you guys you guys will probably this isn't really a very practical tip, but 
when I went to the ICU, I decided that since my badge said Kevin, I was going to call everybody else by their first name. I wasn't going to call him Dr. Smith, I was going to call him Bill. And everybody started calling everybody by their first name. And for some reason, it just kind of levels out the playing field, and everybody knows that we're all there working for the patient, you know, just as much as Nick and Bill and Susan, we're all doing the same thing. So that was my, my level of playing field. In my current job, I don't work for the VA Medical Center. I work for the Veterans Administration, and what I do is not involved with medical issues. I don't have day-to-day -day contact with, with physicians in my current job. My job at hospice, I had a lot of contact with physicians. It was a, it was a collaborative team type thing like that. We had meetings every week. We talked about the patients. And the social work input was pretty important there about, you know, because we're looking at the overall situation, what's, what's going on with this patient, how we make things better for them. So, you know, and it, it was always a good relationship with all the physicians we had. Some, so I, you know, it was just, I would just talk to them, say, hey, here's what's going on, here's what I've observed, and here's what I think is what we need to, to do about that. And, and the, you know, those suggestions were always taken seriously, so I appreciate that. And, um, Communication is key then. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, was, I would just talk to them and say, well, we had good, we always had pretty good physicians working there. So. Okay. So, last question I have for you, where do you see the field of, of social work going in the next couple of years, couple of decades even? What's kind of the future looking like? Um, you know, I'm, my hope is that you'll, you'll see, um, I mean, we re like I said, we recently got title protection, so my hope is that you'll um, see social work more accepted by different insurance companies to be able to provide psychotherapy for individuals and for folks. Um, I hope that the, the field of social worker is actually trying to do a lot more research to make sure that we're having results-oriented uh, treatment uh, for folks. Um, and I, you know, I think potentially with the affordable, new Affordable Health Care Act that there might, there's more mandated social workers involved in different aspects of health care to help people in their environment be able to overcome some of the obstacles that they have to maintain public development. And uh, I would say just to talk about the future health care, I can I'm, I'm a social worker. I, I'm kind of concerned about one thing, and that is funding, because you know we're, the U.S. government is operating a pretty significant deficit. And in the past, often, kind of social work positions have been sort of seen as sort of peripheral and more subject to layoff, et cetera, than other jobs. But in fact, that's not the case. In fact, if you want to get the patients where they need to be, you've got to have someone involved taking care of the issues, their life, their you know, environment, their surroundings, not just whatever their medical issue is. So I'm hoping that, you know, as time goes by that'll be seen as a way to save money. Rather than, you know, keeping the social worker is gonna be a way to save money. <laughs> and getting rid of the social worker, which I think is actually the case, but as to whether or not, you know, when the people make the policy. So that's the downsides. It could be that, that there'll be fewer opportunities in the social worker. But it could also be that they'll be more. Mm -hmm. so. so one final thing to kind of wrap things up. If thinking about all the different health mental health degrees out there, what is unique about social work or what sets it apart from other degrees that you could get in mental health? I mean I think our our different examples point towards one of the, one of the basic tenets of social work is that you treat the person in the environment. Um, and so that's a little bit different than some of the other fields. Um, meet the patient where they are is another one of our tenants. And, uh, and treating folks with unconditional positive regard, um, regardless of what their history is or what they bring with them to the interaction with the social worker. So um, I think that those are, those are the big things that sense of I would say it's broader. I mean, you, you deal with more, I mean, you learn about more different and you deal with more different things. And I was telling someone about being a social worker the other day, and I said, you know, the fact is, the various jobs I've had, I know so much more about what life is like for people up and down the strat of our society than almost anybody except other social workers. <laughs> because, you know, we get involved in, you know, all those kinds of things, and it's, it's you know, it's nice to have that kind of knowledge. And... But also, like I said, I think it's a, it's broader in that we you know we have to know how to do so many more things than a lot of the other so you know, 
you know, mental health professionals have to know how to do. They know how to treat this or they know how to treat that, but they don't know how to, you know, deal with somebody who can't get child care for their, you know, their baby or has intense medical problems for a kid and they can't get off of work to deal with that or, you know, whatever issues come up with it for someone who's out in the, in the community that we deal with that other professionals, they only see them once we get them there. I like to tell people I'm a jack of all trades, but a master of social work. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> That's how you, what you say, the degree. You're a master of social work. That's right. Okay. Any closing comments or final kind of two cents for undergrads? No, I mean you know there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of different ways to impact and to help patients and, and individuals. Um, I think social work is a very important one. Um, you know, I encourage you if you have any. Uh, interest in social work, that you look into some of the different schools of social work. There's lots of available resources on the web uh, that can give you an idea of what are the kind of things you can do with a social work degree. Um, you know, it, it, for me, it's, it's a life profession. So, yeah. Like I said before, it's not a bad way to spend a career. It really isn't. So. All right. Thank you guys so much. You're welcome. Thank you.